Hello. My name is Natalie Weisenbaum. I'm the lead designer, developer, and co-creator of the SAS stylesheet preprocessor, and I lead the CSS infrastructure team at Google. And I'm here today to tell you why good design is anti-capitalist. First, I want to ask a question. What do we design for? We don't design to create beauty. Design can involve art, and art can involve design, but they aren't exactly the same thing. What do we design for? When we design a website or a print layout, or in my case, a programming language, what is our fundamental goal? It's agency. It's giving our users the ability to enact their desires, their goals, on the world around them. A well-designed social media site gives users the ability to choose what they share, to whom they share it with, and whose information they see when they log on. A well-designed cookbook gives users the ability to understand and become confident in cooking recipes. It gives them the ability to see the ingredients that they want to use, to understand how to preheat the oven. It gives them the agency to create what they want to eat and to serve to other people. A well-designed programming language gives users new ways of thinking about problems. It creates a mental space that gives the users new kinds of agency that they wouldn't have otherwise if they had just been using whatever came before. To get a little philosophical, Immanuel Kant talks about what he calls the categorical imperative, which is the foundational truth that he believes all of ethics can be logically derived from. He actually thinks that there are three different formulations of it, but we're only going to be talking about one here, my personal favorite, what he calls the kingdom of ends. This is the statement that you must treat everyone as an end in and of themselves rather than a means to an end. An end in and of themselves. Good design treats its users as ends in and of themselves. It tries to meet their goals rather than just treating them as a means to profit. Design is about giving users agency. But capitalism requires the strategic denial of agency. Why is this? Isn't capitalism just the free and voluntary exchange of money for goods and services? That's a common misconception, but it's not accurate. Capitalism is specifically a system that allows money to purchase capital. There's another piece of jargon. What is capital? Capital is the ownership of the value produced by the labor of other people. Anything you get paid just for owning rather than for your own labor is capital. If you're a landlord renting out property, that's capital. If you're an employer making money off of your employer's labor, that's capital. Now, if you're working at a workers' co-op, that's not capital because everyone owns it. If you are self-employed, that's not capital because you don't have any employees. Capital is inherently exploitative. It doesn't work unless the people who are renting property pay more than it takes to maintain that property, which means whoever comes in with the most money or the best nefarious plan to finagle ownership of public goods wins everything. They are able to accumulate the most because they start with the most. This is then the first fundamental denial of agency under capitalism. No exchange is really free or voluntary if your food, your safety, your housing are on the line. You aren't voluntarily choosing to enter into these exploitative relationships because if you don't do so, you'll end up sick, 
you'll end up homeless. And that is an untenable outcome. So people under capitalism are denied the agency to make free and voluntary exchanges. So what is capitalism? I gave a definition earlier, but I want to swing back to it. Capitalism is the exchange of money for capital. People often use money and capital as interchangeable, but that's not true. They're only the same thing in a system where money can always be used to purchase capital. And that system is what we call capitalism. In a capitalist system, the people who hold the capital, or the vast majority of the capital, are called capitalists, or to use a more jargony term, the bourgeoisie. But capital preceded capitalism. Under feudalism, capital was held by the aristocracy. And rather than being exchanged by money, it was primarily transferred through war or through marriage or inheritance. And during the rise of capitalism, the merchant class gradually overcame the aristocracy as the primary holders of capitalism. But the story of that is the subject for a much longer talk. Capitalism requires constant growth. Capitalists are, exist in a state of perpetual competition with one another, where their capital informs how much power they have, how much of their will they're able to exert on the world around them. But because there are always other capitalists trying to exert their own will, there's this constant evolutionary pressure to grow, to take the capital that they have, take the profits that that capital generates, and fold it back into producing more capital. They invest the profits in further ventures that will continue to be profitable. But that means that they constantly need new profitable investments in order to be able to compete with the other capitalists. So as capital grows, the set of possible investments must grow as well. The pool of profitable things to fold their money back into must grow. And that growth is always eventually unsustainable. And so capitalism runs into crisis after crisis where they have to create new markets in which to fold their profits. Early on, this was done by buying up public goods. You can Google Highland clearances to learn, for example, about early capitalism in England and Scotland buying up the public land that was used for grazing. As these public goods became more consumed, the Industrial Revolution started up and the profit was folded into building factories and hiring labor to produce goods that no one had seen before. And these goods were sold all over Europe, but eventually the market for these goods became saturated and they needed a new place to sell in order to be able to profitably invest in continuing to expand their productive capacity. So they turned their eyes overseas to the colonies that had previously been primarily suppliers of raw materials and labor. And soon, these colonies became new markets. They became a place for capital to expand its profitable base more broadly than it could ever have imagined before. And so in this way, capitalism metastasizes itself across oceans, across nations, and it overcame its first major crisis at the cost of the good of the world. So capitalism overcame crisis after crisis as it evolved, and eventually we come to the stage we're in now, which people call late capitalism. And now, capital has two strategies for 
increasing the size of its markets and enabling itself to continue growing. The first one is to create markets for things that no one actually has a need for, that no one really intrinsically wants. And the second one is to take away the things that people already have and sell them back to it at a profit, a kind of modernized Highland clearance. This, then, is the second denial of agency. Given a choice, people wouldn't buy the things they don't need. People certainly wouldn't buy the things they already have. So capitalism must deny them the ability to choose, the agency to decide what to have in their lives and what not to have. So let's bring this back to design. We, as designers, are caught between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, we all understand, I think, on an intuitive level, that good design enables our users to have agency, and we want to give them that agency. That's why we became designers. On the other hand, we're also laborers. We are beholden to our jobs, to the capital that we labor under. So this leads to bad design as companies lean on their workers to create designs that prioritize profit rather than prioritizing the agency of their users. We are all ourselves users. And so I'm sure we've experienced this when we use products. For example, I'm a heavy Twitter user. I use it all the time to talk to my friends, to make stupid jokes occasionally to communicate serious things. And I constantly run into this issue. Whenever Twitter rolls out a new feature, they rearrange the buttons. They put a button where another button used to be. And so they co-opt users' muscle memory to press the new thing, engage with the new product, even when users aren't trying to do that. In fact, especially when users aren't trying to do that to drive their engagement, to drive their growth, but to deny users the agency to do the thing they came there to do. I remember when the quote retweet feature first launched. For example, the retweet button always opened a quote retweet, and you had to do some arcane additional thing to just do a normal retweet. And I'm sure that got lots of people doing quote retweets who wouldn't have otherwise, but it only did so at the cost of a little bit of their agency to decide what they actually wanted to do. Or, to use another example, the search pane is constantly filled with advertisements and tabloid-esque news stories that serve expressly to deny users the agency of doing what they were trying to do. If you go to the search page, you are, by definition, looking for something in particular, and yet it tries to distract you with all of these messy things. And then I think the most nefarious example in Twitter, the algorithmic timeline. This specifically denies users the agency to choose what they want to see, to have control over the the feed of information coming to them. And it replaces that with whatever Twitter thinks will be most profitable for Twitter. And obviously that involves some input from the user. You mostly see things by people you follow, but that's not the same thing as truly having the agency to decide for yourself what you see. Now, I'm picking on Twitter because I use Twitter a lot, but these problems, especially the algorithmic timeline, are true for pretty much any social media site under the sun. Then there's Netflix. Netflix has the same algorithmic problem, despite not even being social media. It shows the recommendations and hides anything it doesn't think you want to see. It robs users of the agency to even see what, which set of recommendations appears on the home page. I can't 
count the number of times I was looking for a specific show and I just had to dig through whatever new list of recommendations Netflix posted to find whatever I was previously watching. But even worse than that, Netflix has an algorithm for its creators as well. It denies artists the agency to choose what they want to create. And I don't want to downplay how much, especially the creation of film, has historically been shaped by capitalism, because of course it has. But Netflix takes this to new heights by applying infinite metrics and data and even AI to the creations that it sponsors and having a very, very heavy hand in the creative process. If you read anything written by creators who have made Netflix specific things, they'll all say, yeah, Netflix told me exactly, do this, don't do that. And I'm sure it optimized for viewer numbers, but it wasn't my vision. And I think that is a real creative loss to the world. And it also represents a limit to even the universe of things that people can see. Even if you're willing to go searching through Netflix or finding whichever streaming service has whatever you want to see, there are a pretty limited set of things that are on any streaming service at all. I don't know if any of you have recently tried to watch Naked Lunch by David Cronenberg, one of my personal favorites of his. It's not on any streaming service, at least at the time I wrote this talk. I'm personally lucky enough to be able to walk down the street into a real brick and mortar video store, shouts out to Scarecrow Video in Seattle, and rent just about any movie I can name. But most people aren't that lucky because the streaming services have all driven the video stores out of business. This is another example of capitalism buying up the things that are valuable to us. Even though these things weren't exactly public goods, they were destroyed because capital came in with enough money to put almost everything you would want to watch on a streaming service. And then, only then, once the video stores were wiped out, these streaming services paired back on their licensing agreements. They fragmented into a million different services. And now, if you want to watch just about anything, you have to pay tons of dollars a month, and you might still not be able to find it. Then there's web advertising. Web ads are kind of sold to us on this premise of ads are useful because they tell us about things we didn't even know we needed. But that's just a smokescreen. That is a denial of agency. Web ads are fundamentally and universally about trying to distract people from what they are trying to do and get them to focus on something else. They universally and fundamentally corrode agency. We've all heard this saying, if you're not paying, you're the product. And that's just another way of saying that you are not being treated as an end in and of yourself. You are being treated as a means to an end of profit by anything that is based fundamentally on web ads as an engine of profit. Advertising is fundamental to manufacturing desire and creating new markets by doing so. And then there's Apple. It's known for its good design, but so much of that is superficial. I'll admit, an iPad has a nice silhouette. It feels good and weighty in the hand. The icons are pretty. But the operating system, in so many ways, exists fundamentally to deny users agency. I can't install my own applications on this without Apple's arbitrary approval. The applications that do exist ban adult content. I'm a queer person. And so much of my life gets classified as adult content. This seeps beyond their own platform. Discord and Tumblr both have started clamping down hard on adult content 
well outside of iOS because of the threat of being delisted from the App Store. And this has seriously, concretely affected my queer communities. I have had trouble talking with people because the, the way we talk as queer communities is so deeply tied to things that are so often classified as adult. And so for my money, there's no company that more deeply or perniciously denies agency than Apple. And I hold their reputation for good design in the utmost contempt, even as I use their products. Well, that's kind of a bummer. What can we do about it? How can we as designers fight back against a system that is built so thoroughly to deny our users agency? Well, first of all, we can do what we can in the workplace to give our users agency, to give them the ability to realize their goals and their desires, even when it wouldn't be strictly the most profitable possible thing. We can create designs that tear down the walls, that allow users to expand beyond small walled gardens. In SaaS, for example, this is a small thing, but we do everything we can to remain compatible with CSS. We try to make sure that we aren't a separate thing that people have to choose to use only that, but that we are an extension of CSS, something that you can start using very easily and if you want to stop using very easily. We can socialize an understanding of deceptive design as something that is unacceptable, that we won't do. There's this terrific website, deceptive.design, which catalogs the ways that designs are able to deny user agency, that they're able to draw profit at the expense of meeting users' needs. And we can help curate this, help socialize it, help create a universal understanding in our trade that these are not things we do. These are not acceptable ways to design. We can form unions. We can join with other workers to exert more power collectively than we could individually and thereby have more control over what designs get created. We can form worker co-ops and try to resist the capitalist profit motive as best we can. One of my favorite recent examples of this is cohost.org, a new social media website that is a workers' co-op founded actually by a few friends of mine that is committed to user agency. It has no algorithm. It has no metrics. It is fundamentally dedicated to showing users exactly what they want to see to allow them to communicate with whom they want to communicate. Anything we can do that helps give users agency is itself a noble act. But ultimately, we're not going to be able to simply design our way out of this. We can do all the good designs we want, and that's great, and it can help. But ultimately, capitalism corrupts everything it touches. Profit-hungry capitalists will always try to eat anything that isn't being as profitable as possible and optimize it and squeeze every ounce of profit. And this will always, always be at the detriment of its workers and its users' agency. And so, to truly enact good design, we must destroy capitalism. That's a tall order, I understand that. But as Rabbi Tarfon said, it is not your duty to complete the work, but neither are you free to neglect it. We have to do our part to try to tear down at least a brick of this edifice that is keeping our user's agency in check. One of my favorite ways of doing that is known as base building. It's the idea 
of creating structures that give power to people in order to be able to struggle more effectively against the forces of capital. And this doesn't have to be violent. This can be helping to create tenants unions or labor unions, anything where people join together to meet the real needs that other people have right now or that they themselves have and build structures that can last, that can create group power. So go out, join your tenants unions, join your worker unions, join socialist organizations, join anarchist organizations, do anything you can to help build this power. Because ultimately, capitalism constantly enters crises. And the moment one of these crises can be addressed better by the people than it can by capitalism, that's when capitalism falls. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good morning. And welcome to Natalie. Natalie, oh my gosh, there are so many wonderful pieces in your talk. I think every other sentence is a quote that I want to write down and put up next to my computer and look at every day. Um, so thank you so much and welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. We're so happy to have you. I, uh, I have chills uh, just thinking about so many things that you brought up and um, especially for me, one of the pieces that really stood out is how you're talking about giving users agency and that capitalism is a strategic denial of agency. And while that also sits heavily with me, I'm just so glad that you said it that way. Um, because I think when we're naming it, we're able to really do something about it. So just want to say thank you for that. Um, I can see that the Brella chat is blowing up. I know that there is a lot of clapping going on in there. I could hear everybody in New Orleans. So I think there's a lot that we can dig into here. I think uh, a lot of times we see design processes, for example, um, that were built um, when before we were in them, maybe like when we're joining a new team or something like that, or even design history that's prioritized very uh, specific uh, aesthetic standards originating from just a few countries. Could you speak more to the way that history informs our present day structures and what we can do to analyze it and maybe move away from it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you're absolutely right that there's a sort of hegemonic Western idea of what good design and sort of the the desired aesthetic looks like. I think this comes from um, both a uh, uh, the ways that Western countries are more represented in the the people who are creating those designs and setting those standards in the people who sort of have the high level power in organizations who, even have the freedom to join startups early on and set those standards. Um, and it also comes even uh, when those, those factors aren't at play, just from a, a, a notion of prestige that just comes inherently along with being a, a wealthier country or, and, and having aesthetics. Like you can see throughout history that there's a, a push towards understanding the the ways that um, Western cultures exist and operate as um, uh, the, the right way to do so, even when there's no real a priori reason to do so. For example, the, the use of the business suit worldwide is um, largely just an export of colonialism from um, Western countries. Uh, as far as addressing it, I think it always, always comes back to collective action. We always have more power together than we do individually. We can always uh, join together as workers and as an industry and say, this is what we do. Um, this is how we operate. And we, we are setting new standards and we're looking in new places. And I think the most important thing, especially when thinking about trying to bring new aesthetic principles to the table, trying to um, 
open the the path for um, thoughts and concepts that come from outside this hegemonic Western sphere is um, understanding that solidarity has to extend beyond sort of our own individual groups um, and, and has to sort of cross boundaries. Like as a queer person, as a white queer person, um, I hold it primary in my political thought and action to have solidarity with people of color, even if they aren't queer and to understand the way that capitalism and the oppressive structures of the world push on all of us and seek to divide us against one another. Um, there's this, this concept I'm sure everyone's heard of called identity politics, um, mm -hmm. which is used in a lot of different ways. Um, but one of the ways it's, it's talked about in left discourse is this idea of centering identity as a, um, as a wedge issue, as a way of dividing people up and um, uh, trying to get people to focus solely on their own identity. And I wanna be really clear here that the solution to that is not to act as though we don't have our own identities and our own histories and the way we are oppressed. Like what you were asking about is fundamentally how can we bring our identities that aren't uh, part of this hegemonic culture to bear? How can we design in a way that understands where we're coming from and respects that? Because that's a crucial, crucial thing to creating good design is bringing in everybody's history and, and taking the lessons from these places that are historically um, ignored or or under-recognized, um, underestimated, as a speaker from uh, yesterday said. Um, so it's not about it's not about pretending everyone is the same. It's about understanding that our identities are all important and that the especially the ways that we are oppressed all intersect with one another, that every category of oppression is um, something that is experienced simultaneously with every other category, right? Um, there are queer people of color, of course. There are people who are disabled and queer and disabled and of color and all of these things come together and affect each one, each person's life individually and so have to be addressed collectively. Um, so I think having that level of solidarity with one another is the way we can push for these things and build collective action that really supports everybody and everyone's individual identity. I think that's absolutely wonderful. And I think we're we're finally getting to those um, conversations, not just in design, um, but in a lot of tech conversations. I've seen this across uh, Twitter as well, too, of collective care um, and that being a way for society to move forward. So I think um, in the design lens, I'm, I'm thinking about that a little bit of, of, of our process and how we can change that. So I love that you're bringing that into this. I love that we are not just trying to build the happy path with whatever we're building and actually trying to get to all of the cases that users need. The happy path is when everybody can be on the happy path. I, I frequently hear edge cases and, and that phrase doesn't always sit well with me because I think it it definitely deprioritized the underestimated um, identities and, and groups um, the most. So um, Thank you so much for that. Kind of going from there, um, the the recommendations, uh, the algorithm recommendations example that you brought up uh, has come up in in Brella as well. And it really struck me because I think designers uh, were used to um, using a lot of resources, and our current relationship with apps um, is to like build other apps. Like we use inspiration from our experience with apps to build other stuff. I know I'm guilty of it. I can see 
tons of times where I'm like, oh, this would be great to do for this. And it's just like this other app I use. And it sort of feels a little bit like um, we're using the existing design patterns and building off of that rather than doing what you're talking about, which is starting something new or building something back up from the ground. And um, I think some of this is going to require um, unlearning and then relearning new practices. So how might we build this into our practice so that we can do the work such as joining unions or joining the groups uh, or clubs or things like that that you mentioned? That's a great question. I think it comes down to developing critical thinking skills. And that's like, that's sort of a term that sounds very like a thing you'd get evaluated on in grade school, right? But I want to, I want to dissect it a little bit. Um, I mean, specifically thinking in a way you would do as a critic. And I think this is a skill that can be developed in, in very broad ways. It's very holistically applicable. So when you're engaging with a, uh, a design, um, take a moment and think about what it is that is working for you, what it isn't. Um, think about the ways it's giving you agency and the ways it's not. Um, write it down. Uh, talk with other people. Um, and do this even in things that aren't just using an app. I think you can really develop and hone your critical thinking skills by thinking critically about art. Be an art critic. Anytime you watch a TV show or uh, a movie, play a video game, think about like, you know, not just am I enjoying this, but how does it function as art? What is its goals? How is it meeting those goals? How is it failing those goals? Um, and that will really help hone this muscle of uh, understanding how to take apart a system that you're interacting with and see which parts of it work and what they work towards. Because understanding what what the actual uh, effect of a system or an application does um, is, uh, is crucial to being able to, to talk about it and, and being able to create new things, as you said. Um, uh, the best things that are created are created with a deep understanding of what didn't work and what did work about what came before. And that is true across all mediums, across art, across design, um, uh, across engineering. I think there's, there's a lot to be learned also from educational practices. Um, one of the books I read uh, a few years ago that really affected me was, um, I'm completely blanking on the name. Um, let me let me do a quick Google search and I'll find it. Um, Love it. I'm so excited about this because I love a lot of books and um, I think we, we we should start a little clarity book club because I think there's a lot of good resources being shared. So I'm excited for what you're about to share with us. I'm the my cursory Google searches aren't coming up with it. Um, I'll do a little more looking in the background, but um, the uh, the the general concept is taking education and framing it as a uh, collaborative process rather than a a process of imparting objective knowledge from an educator to people to students who are sort of a different class of being than the educator. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's the concept of taking a, um, uh, a group of people and having them collaboratively sort of describe their own experiences and create a, a theory and an understanding of their world together rather than um, uh, being passed down. And I think this is really helpful for 
having a uh, a strong, um, uh, uh, no, that's not, here we go. Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Paulo Freire um, is, is the name of the book. Strongly recommend anyone who is interested in education or learning reads that. Um, uh, so I, I think that's another way to structure a, um, uh, an understanding of how we can move past the things that don't work on um, uh, in existing apps and that deny agency is creating these groups of people who are striving to learn among one another um, and and develop this understanding. Like you were saying, like a like a reading group um, having a, uh, a a reading group, but for application design. That, yeah, that's that's a really great point. And, and to your point on education, it's not just the classroom. There is, we're still learning every day. And I think um, in the traditional classroom or education environment, which are not the only ways to learn, and I think we all, all know that, um, it, it, I think we've been conditioned to uh, like teach to the test or learn to the test. So there's a right answer, there's a wrong answer, there's a grade at the end of it. And I think with a lot of what you're saying about critical thinking gets into um, a little bit more of something called the um, the learning edge. And it uh, it's sort of like a, a circular graphic example that has, here's our comfort level. Here's the, this is a little bit uncomfortable and I'm going to learn potentially learn something new. And then this outer part that is like really uncomfortable. And, and a lot of this theory covers that when you're in the center, um, second, not the smallest circle, not the comfort zone, but you're in that uh, learning edge where you're a little bit uncomfortable, that's when you have the most sort of growth mindset and are able to learn more about other people's um, uh, people's experiences that are different than yours, uh, able to apply new ideas. So I think that works really well with what you're saying about critical thinking. All right. So uh, just to wrap up, Natalie, where can people follow your work? Um, I'm on Twitter for however much longer that lasts and uh, co-host as Next3 and awesome. uh, GitHub as well. Next3, N-E-X3, pretty much everywhere. Awesome. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Please give Natalie a big round of applause in person and in the chat.